ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره الكافرون صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وبعد the royal father of the day his highness the may tangali alhaji Taladi Sanusi Mayamba your royal highness sir and for your information his royal highness is an all time friend and associate but i'm only saying an all time friend and associate that was then but now i can't call him my friend anche do when the zama sarki ya wuce sa'a so he is our father the chairman of the occasion my mentor alhaji salah damburan the magajin malam gombe and the secretary of the jamaat nusul islam gombe state chapter magajin malam has said a lot about me but let me tell you Maga Jamalan truly deserves the title Maga Jamalan. Permit me because he is the chairman to give you just a 2 minute story. In 1990 when the when crisis engulfed the schools in Gombe zone. 1990 that is in the former Bauchi state. Crisis engulfed all the secondary schools and teachers colleges in Gombe zone. and all of them were clo- were closed down the crisis started here from gombe science secondary school and at that time the teachers here in gombe zone were sharply divided into two along religious divide the other side came went and formed their association and the muslims also formed their muslim teachers association on the other side all of them all the principals and there were more principals on the other side than on our side of the muslims and all of them were principals but the the few principals amongst us were afraid of coming to meetings and were afraid of associating themselves alaji salah damburan then i could remember was a vice principal and he was the only one among them one principal may come to a meeting today in another meeting he will not come alaji salah amburan remained doggedly with us and when a judicial commission of inquiry was appointed then by the military governor of bauchi state and the commission was sitting in gombe local government secretariat we wrote a mo- me- memo to present to the commission and then it was said that i should present the memo i said how could i present the memo before the commission when i was less than one year into teaching with the bochester government and there were issues stated in the memo running back to around 1970s that in 1978 this thing happened in doma secondary school in 1970 this i said i can't present a memo because a lawyer could ask me were you there as a teacher it was all, uh, of all our old time teachers at that time it was alhaji salat amburam that offered and courageously offered himself to go and present the memo when everybody among the senior teachers were shying away maga jumala ala sab binani the honorable commissioner of justice and the attorney general of gombe state the chulomangombe the chairman 
O Amir of the National Islamic Center, Gombe State Chapter. Other distinguished personalities, the chairman of the Shura, Barrister Abdul Ghani Bello. Uh, fellow presenters, they have been called discussants, but I see them as fellow presenters because all the three are persons of respected intellectual standing. I have a great deal of respect and regard for each and every person of the three. Man Abdullah Bakar Lamido, Ibn Najibi La Yenjab, Wa Ida Najiba Faka Abahu. When I say Abahu, I don't mean his biological father, but including myself. And then Malan Nasru Ishaq is a thinker. I respect him as a thinker. If we would have some few additional persons like Malan Nasr Ishaq, the way he thinks, our Ummah will not be in the same way it is. Dr. Baba Isle is coming up as a very promising academic and uh, as it was said, a public commentator, but a very promising academic at that. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Malam uh, Maga Jamala has said, and of course, the Amir of the Ummah has also stated that I am no stranger to Gombe. And indeed, Maga Jamala said, I can be called the son of the soil. Yes, I am always filled with a great deal of nostalgia and emotions whenever I am invited to come and present a lecture in Gombe. I remember the 30 years ago with all our youthful exuberance and our youthful zeal and enthusiasm how we join hands together with the persons of the like of the Amir of the Ummah, uh, Dr. Abu Bakr Sadiq and many others that I cannot mention but most importantly the person that we fondly call Rais, Mala Abdullahi Rais who was our Amir of the Muslim Student Society of Nigeria, who led us to make MSS in Gombe Area Council then very great. So I'm filled with a lot of nostalgia. And to buttress what Maga Jamala has said, this hall, I cannot forget this hall for a number of reasons, because this hall used to be part of the government science secondary school where I taught. So I know this hall when I was a teacher in this school. But I can also not forget this hall because when I finished my PhD in 2006, my brothers and sisters in Gombe, before I could even be, before my PhD could even be celebrated in Bauchi, my PhD was celebrated ahead of any other place in Gombe because it was in this hall that my brothers and sisters organized a reception to celebrate my PhD in Gombe. So I cannot forget this hall, and I will never forget Gombe. I am part and parcel of Gombe. Alhamdulillah. Now, coming to the subject matter of our lecture, the Hijra. The Hijra of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here in particular. Lessons from Hijra to the 21st century Islamic world. To the first 21st century Islamic world. I think that is the correct title. Ko. Naga Anam program Anche to the 21st Islamic world. Maybe it's a mistake. To the 21st century Islamic world. Now, in the first instance, let us make an attempt to discuss some of the key terms in the topic, the Hijra, and then the 21st century, and perhaps the Islamic world. The Hijra, as we all know, is an Arabic word. Literally, it means al-intiqal, wal-ibti'ad, wa-tark. Intiqal, 
to abandon to leave a particular point or to to leave a particular thing or to leave a particular situation to another or to move away from one situation or one place or one point to another or to completely abandon something there are two ahadith, two hadith that connot this meaning this literal meaning for example the hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says la yahillu limri in muslim an yahjura akhahu al muslim al hadith it is not permitted for a muslim to hijrate to permit to commit to observe or to do hijra from his fellow brother muslim that is to say to uh, to abandon him or to boycott him in this sense or the other hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says wal muhajir man hajara ma naha allah anhu wa rasuluh a muhajir a person that undertakes hijra is the person that has that commits hijra or observes hijra that is abandons or leaves what allah has prohibited or shuns away from what allah has prohibited this is in the literal this gives our as a, a sort of literal meaning of the word hijra but we will come to that again another thing that we need to know about the concept of hijra is that there could be two dimensions to the meaning of hijra hijra in the lit, in the in the sharia sense in the sharia sense hijra can have two perspectives of meaning also you can call it the physical and the non physical hijra the physical hijra where a person physically leaves a particular space to another space leaves a particular place to another place and we get that from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam known to all of us innama al-a'malu bin niyat wa innama li kulli imri'in ma nawa fa man kana minni fa man kanat hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi fa hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi wa man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha aw imra'atin yankihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajara ilayhi the implication of this hadith or the connotation of this hadith is the physical hijra where with your physical body you leave a particular space to another space or you leave a particular place to another place but the non physical hijra can be seen from the hadith that we read earlier al muslimu man salima al muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi wal muhajir man hajara ma naha allah anhu wa rasuluh this is the non physical hijra where you migrate from evil you abandon evil you shun evil this is non physical hijra but the physical hijra is further divided into two types or into two dimensions according to imam al qurtubi he says there can be two dimensions or two categories of the physical hijra hijratul amni wa hijratul iman hijratul am sometimes you 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 undertake hijra in order to get security to be secured like the first hijra according to imam al qurtubi the first hijra by the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from makkah to habasha that is to abyssinia was a hijra for security essentially for security purpose because habasha at that time was not darul islam habasha at that time was not a place where islam governs or so to say but then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he perfectly puts it in its perspective he says there there is a king in whose domain nobody is wronged 
nobody is wronged. That is to say, there is a domain that when you go, you will be protected, you will be secured. So the hijra that was done by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu to Habesha was hijra to Amn. But hijra to Iman, you can see the first category of the hijra is implied is implied in the verse of Surah to Nisa. وَمَنْ يُحَاجِرِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَى وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُحَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ سُمَّ يُدْرِكْهُ الْمَوْتُ فَقَدْ وَقَعَ عَجْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا But the hijrah to al-Iman is the hijrah, the type of hijrah that was undertook, I mean undertaken by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions it was a physical hijrah also but imam al-qurtubi such scholars categorize this as hijrah to iman where you leave a place where you yourself and your iman your faith are being threatened to a place where you can practice your faith and you can also you know accomplish the dictates of your faith where you can establish a domain, so to say, as was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And this hijrah, this particular hijrah, has been mentioned in several places in the Quran. Not in one place of the Quran, not in only one ayah, but in several verse, I mean, uh, surahs and in several verses of the Quran. Referring to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, this hijrah was mentioned in Surah to Tawbah. إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهِ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِ يَفْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولِ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحَزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Al-Aya Or, as pertaining to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mention in Surah Al-Hashr لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُحَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِدْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولًا أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ This is in relation to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and of course at the end of Surah Al-Anfal this particular hijrah was also mentioned but the non-physical hijrah can also be divided into two. It can be hijrah to al-ma'asiya wa hijrah to ahl al-ma'asiya. That is to say, shunning evil doing or wrongdoing as is implied in the hadith that we read. Or boycotting people of evil when people are of evil or when evil is being committed you leave the place you leave the place like it is said in surah to in surah to nisa isn't it وَكَدْ نَزَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ إِذَا سَمِيْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُ بِهَا وَيُسْتَحَزَأُ بِهَا فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُودُوا فِي هَدِيثٍ غَيْرِ إِنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِسْلُهُمْ if you stay with them you will have the same rule applied unto you. So this is boycotting or migrating from evil doing or from a place where evil is being committed. Or you avoid people that are people or persons of evil. وَيَوْمَ يَعَدُّ الظَّالِمُ أَلَا يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَسْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْنَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِسْ فُلَانًا خليلا لقد أدلني أن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خزولا أو like we read in in an أهدري where he says ولا يحل له صحبة فاسق ولا مجالسته بل يجب عليه هجرانه what is necessary is for him to boycott him or to abandon him to migrate away from him
our own interest in this lecture, our focus in this lecture is the Hijrah to Iman, specifically the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, which verses of the Quran made reference to, and these are the verses we just read, the one from Surah to, Surah to Tawbah, and the other one from uh, Surah Al Hashir. Now, what is important for us to understand or to note is the fact that the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an integral part of the Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is an integral part. That is to say, it is a significant part of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For as it were, the Hijrah was a turning point in the Risala, in the prophethood and the messengership of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It closes one chapter of the da'wah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and opens another chapter. So it is a, 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 is, is a significant turning point. You can appreciate the fact that the Hijrah closes a chapter and opens another chapter. You would appreciate that more when you, when you, when you make reference to the fact that even the surahs of the, of the Quran, the, the, the Hijrah, the Hijrah marks the dividing line between the surahs of the Quran such that you have Meccan surahs and you have Medinan surahs. So the Hijrah constitutes a very a, a major landmark in the Risala of the Prophet ﷺ. Now the division between Meccan surahs and Medinan surahs are not just is not just for the sake of it. I mean, further appreciating the significance of the Hijrah, the division of the surahs into Meccan surah and into Medinan surah is not just for the sake of it, but then you would understand the importance when you remember that the Meccan surahs differ in several ways than the Medinan surahs, both in terms of literally construction linguistic appreciation and rendition and also in terms of the rules and laws and in terms of the message they convey while the Meccan surahs essentially address the issue of Iman, Aqidah, Faith the Medinan surahs essentially you know present laws they present laws they pre present social laws they present political laws, they present, you see, uh, juristic laws and legalistic laws. They even present laws regarding war and peace, and so on and so forth, which you don't find in the Meccan surahs. So the Hijrah was a significant turning point. The Hijrah was a significant turning point to the extent that it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if any verse or any chapter was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ after the Hijrah, even if those verses were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in Makkah. Are you following? So, you see, <coughs> the division between Makkah, Makkan surahs and Medinan surahs was not about the space the place where verses or surahs were revealed was about whether they were revealed before the hijrah or after the hijrah to the extent that there were revelations that the prophet ﷺ received in makkah after the hijrah but they are not classified as makkan surahs they are classified as what part of the medinan surahs that demonstrates to you the, the significance of the hijrah as a very I mean, major turning point in the history of Islam and in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Why the Hijrah? You can see 
you can see the reason from what we have said so far you can see the reason why the hijra was made to be the point from which the islamic calendar began to be counted if you appreciate the significance of the hijra the way we have stated then you would uh, you would uh, you would also appreciate the reason why at the time of umar radiallahu anhu it was at the time of khalifa umar radiallahu anhu that the hijra calendar was created and adopted at the time when umar was the caliph events there was the need to document and to record events as they were happening there was the need to document event and to record them as they were happening or to record and document but then when an activity or an event was document was recorded it would only be mentioned that it happened in the month of rajab or it happens in the month of zul hijjah or it happened in the month of shawwal for example then umar at the time was worried ah, which rajab it happens in rajab but which rajab rajab, rajab at what point or in what year so the necessity for having a calendar was you know realized or was it became very clear hence the prophet the, uh, umar radiallahu anhu made consultations he made consultations about the need to have a calendar the need to have a calendar and uh, some people advise the let us begin to uh, to have the calendar or let, let us adopt the persian calendar because there were great empires before uh, the coming of prophet muhammad sallallahu these great empires were the persian empires and the roman the persian empire and the roman empire the byzantium empire and they had their own calendars so umar I mean some people advise let us adopt the Persian calendar others advise let us adopt the Roman calendar that was rejected or those were rejected and then people then looked inwards and therefore some people said let us have it from the time of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam others advise let us have it from the time of the beginning of revelation of the prophet i mean of the quran and there were several you know advice but later an advice came up that we should have it we should have it from the hijra and that advice was accepted and i don't have to repeat the importance of the hijra and the significance of the hijra in order to further illustrate the reason or the the fact that the hijra was very much deserving of being adopted for the purpose of the islamic calendar alhamdulillah we are now in 1443 1443 years after the hijra of the prophet sallallahu we are in the month of ramadan so ramadan was i mean uh, sorry the month of muharram forgive me you know ramadan is so common in our mouth isn't it we are in the month of muharram muharram was adopted as the first month the first month of the hijra calendar and the hijra calendar has 12 months our own calendar the islamic calendar has 12 months to believe that our own calendar is a calendar of 12 months to believe that our own year the islamic year is a year that, con that contains 12 months that is a matter of aqidah it's a matter of aqidah because in some civilizations a year is more than 12 months in some civilizations in other civilizations a year is less than 12 months there are civilizations in which a year is only seven months in other civilizations a year is about is, is more than 12 months but in our own aqidah 
as as why I say it's a, it's a matter of aqidah because it is mentioned in the Quran. Inna iddat al-shuhuri in the Allah ifna ashara shaharan fi kitab Allah yawma khalaq al-samawati wal-arba minha arba atun hurum up to the end of the verse. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was reported to, to have said that Inna zamana qadis tadara kahay atihi as sanatu if da ashara shaharan aw kama kala rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam therefore when it has been categorically stated by the quran and an authentic hadith of the prophet sallam that a year constitutes 12 months it becomes a matter of aqida that you must believe in you cannot have otherwise now like i said the hijrah therefore is an integral part of the seerah this implies that we are therefore confronted in this lecture we are therefore confronted with the task of studying some aspect of the seerah of the prophet ﷺ. not just some aspect but a very important a very significant aspect of the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam therefore what this implies further is that we are going to undertake when the, the when the topic says lessons from the hijra lessons from the hijra to the 21st century islamic world and i wonder perhaps we will come to discuss that when we have just stated when we have just stated that the hijra is our own calendar isn't it and by that we are in the 21st century there must be some wisdom because expectedly expectedly since we're talking about the hijra and the hijra is our own calendar expectedly the title should have read the title should have read lessons from the hijra to the 15th century islamic world respectively but the topic has been coined from hijra to the 21st century islamic world for so from the hijra to the gregorian <laughs> isn't it and we will come and justify that we will come and and, and say why we should talk about the 21st century this means that we're going to undertake what is called fiqh sira when you are talking about lessons from hijra then you are going to undertake what is called fiqh sira the fiqh of sira which means a thematic purposive study of the sira not just the narrative study of the seerah where you just narrate events and happenings for the purpose of people knowing history just a mere narration of events and happening but then purposive study and thematic study where you try to examine and to study to study the implications and applications or even before that you study the context of certain events and then on the basis of the context of the events you now study the implications and applications of that particular event or that particular situation to your own present situation in other words what does that imply to you in your own present context what how does it apply to you in your own present situation this is called fiqh sira before we delve into that the literal meaning of sira the literal meanings of sira means you know sunnah or tabi'ah or whatever in that sense that is the literal meaning that is a person's way of doing things a person's tradition of doing things and when it comes to 
a technical meaning it simply means it simply means everything it simply means everything about prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam everything i repeat everything about prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam constitute the seerah and therefore on the basis of this the seerah has a number of perspectives much as it has a number of dimensions it has a number of domains such that some say some aspect of the seerah focus essentially on the person the very person of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam describing him that is a shamail a shamailul muhammadiyah telling you about the very person of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before i continue let me make a statement here that is very instructive the statement here especially when i was saying seerah means everything about prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is instructive to note that there was there was no human being and there will never be there was no human human being and there will never be any human person whose life was completely comprehensively documented like the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there will never be everything including how he visits the toilet sallallahu alaihi wasallam including his privacy with his family it was reported because everything about his life is guidance laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasanatun liman kana yarju allah wal yawm al akhir wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim so nobody whose life was documented can you imagine any prophet or any messenger before prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whose everything about his human body the width of his forehead the color of his hair the, the size of his head the nature the, the length of his neck the width of his chest the color of his eyes sallallahu alaihi wasallam his helmet his imama his izar everything to the extent that when imam tirmizi wrote a book wrote his book wrote his book ash-shama'il muhammadiya he made some two verse poems where he says in fatakum in fatakum anta rawhu bil uyuni fama yafutukum wasfuhu hadhi shama'iluhu mukammalu dhati fi khalqin wa fi khuluqin wa fi sifatin fala tuhsa fadailuhu in fatakum if you miss the opportunity of seeing him physically sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Oi, shawara akuma Hausa. In Gausa kenan ku. Chairman, me yake gani? The way, the pattern I have taken, I will be more comfortable completing it in English. Amma me yake gani? Okay. ان فاتكم ان تروه بالعيون فما يفوتكم وصفه هذه شمائله مكمل الذات في خلق وفي خلق وفي صفات فلا توصى فضائله if you had missed the opportunity of seeing him physically here i present you his description his total description مكمل الذات he is perfect in his physical composition and in his in his physique wa fi khuluqin and he is perfect in his character fala tu safada ilahu his virtues cannot be outcounted that is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is just one dimension of the seerah 
Another dimension of the sira is Ghazawatu Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The battles, the wars and battles that were fought by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other aspect of the surah is just narration. Narration of all that happened from his birth or even before his birth. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taking it taking it from even his genealogy even his genealogy from Ibrahim alayhi salam to Ismail alayhi salam down to his father Abdullah and to him sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and then to his birth his child his infancy his childhood his adolescence his adulthood his prophethood sallallahu alayhi sallam his life in Mecca that is the narrative aspect of the hijra which was done by many books i mean the narrative aspect of his sira which was done by many uh sira scholars like ibn hisham and others ibn jarir and others so but others concentrate like i said on his political life others concentrate on his social life others concentrate on his military life that is his ghazawat and so on and so forth so here we are confronted with the study of the sira but essentially the fiqh of sira and therefore what we will be concerned with it's not just about the narration of the hij of how the hijra took place but about the significance of the hijra number one that we have done we don't have to repeat that aspect the significance of the hijra in islamic history but then what other important lessons are contained in the hijra that are applicable to our present day situation Now, here we are, trying to study the lessons of the Hijra to our present world, the so-called 21st century world. What is the logic? What is the logic behind studying the implications and applications of the Sira? and in particular the hijra to our present situation you see you may meet a free thinker or you may meet an atheist or yet a non-muslim who does not believe you may you may meet a munafiq who may say why would you concern yourself about happenings that happened 15 centuries ago what is its importance to our present situation the logic the rationale are located in the fact that the prophethood and the messengership of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam are universal we have not sent you but a mercy to the entire creation to the entire universe the universality of the messengership of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam necessitates necessitates that we must study the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in particular the hijra we must study the hijra the lessons of the hijra against our present situation and even beyond because the messengership of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not restricted to his time and therefore the sira has universal implications as much as it has universal applications and indeed it has universal appeal universal appeal number two it is necessary and it is just the other side of the of the of the point i have mentioned it's just the other side not a different point actually the source the essential source of the sira 
the major source or the primary source of the seerah which is the Quran the Quran regardless of all the books of seerah that were written you take all the books of seerah and the books of tarikh the most reliable the primary source of the seerah the primary source of the seerah is the Quran especially if you take it from the point of view of Ash-Shama'il or any character of the Prophet ﷺ, or any action of the Prophet ﷺ, Nana Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana khuluquhul Qur'an. Kana khuluquhul Qur'an. His character is the Qur'an. His political character, his character in terms of politics, statecraft and administration, his character in terms of war and security, his character in terms of family life, his character in terms of personal conduct and interpersonal and intergroup relationship his character in terms of everything kana khuluquhul quran so quran is the primary source of the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and indeed you would also see further illustration of the fact that the quran is the primary source of the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam take any aspects for example take the ghazawat ghazawat to rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam you find that most of the ghazawat have been narrated in the quran the first war the battle of badr narrated elaborately and illustriously in surah al-anfal battle of hud uhud narrated elaborately and illustriously in Surah to Ali Imran. Which other battles again? You remember them. Battle of Khandak narrated elaborately and illustriously in Surah to Al Ahzab and so on and so forth. Battle of Tabuka illustriously and elaborately narrated in Surah to Tawbah. So you can see. The seerah of the, I mean the, the Quran is the primary source of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and bearing in mind the fact that the Quran is a universal book. The Quran is a universal book. The final message and the universal book. And therefore, if the Quran is a universal message, and if it is the essential and primary source of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, therefore, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ has universal appeal. It has universal implications. It has universal applications. Therefore, we can study the, sur the seerah. We can examine the lessons of the seerah against our present situation, against the 21st century and then if we accept the fact that the Quran the Quran is the primary source of the seerah that takes us to another level to accept the fact that to accept the fact that while we are studying while we are studying the lessons of the seerah we are doing that with a great deal of conviction about its truth with a great deal of assurance that we are not basing our study or our analysis or our Im or examining the implications against some fiction that never happened no facts that were established by the quran because if the quran is the primary source of the seerah then you will be rest assured that when you are studying the seerah you are studying something reliable because the quran is reliable because the finality of the quran has a lot of implications the fact that the quran is the final message it implies universality meaning that if it is not universal if the quran does not have universal appeal the whole idea of its finality is defeated but then it remains original it cannot be distorted, it cannot be corrupted. The seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is the only narrative, is the only story of any prophet that has remained 
incorruptible because the Quran gives it protection. It gives it protection. For it, if, if, it, if it can be corrupted and distorted, then his, the finality of his prophethood is defeated. And the universality of his messengership is also defeated. So, And so and so forth. Let me not take much time on this, but there are a number of other implications, including the fact that the seerah of the Prophet presents to us a sublime and a perfect model for life. It presents a sublime and a perfect model for life. That is to say, in a very practical situation, in a very practical sense, you cannot have a perfect model for life, which also has universal appeal, I keep repeating, and universal implication and application, like the life of the Prophet Wasallam the seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let me stop at that i believe the discussions will come and fill in the gaps why would we study the seerah against the 21st century why not against the 15th century does that mean they, 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 we, we are not attaching an importance to the, to the Hijra dating or to the Hijra calendar? No, it wouldn't mean that. I believe the organizers don't mean to downplay the significance or the importance of the 20, I mean 15th century Hijra calendar. A justification to be offered in this regard is the fact that, yes, of course, the Gregorian calendar is not part of our Akida. Are you following? Yes. But the Gregorian calendar is a historical reality that you cannot dismiss and you cannot run away from. It's a historical reality that you cannot dismiss, neither can you run away from. What do I mean by a historical reality? It is here with us, it is dominant and it is very much effective and it affects us in very practical ways. policies governmental policies all over the world in the in all the countries in the world governmental policies events and a number of very practical things are all hinged to unfortunately hinge to the 21st century and then whether we like it or not the 21st century constitutes a practical epoch in human history. Let me further demonstrate this. The 21st century constitutes a significant epoch in human history when we refer to the Western periodization of history. Western periodization of history. You see, civilizations all have their own perspectives of history. But then, the dominant periodization of history in the world today, unfortunately, is the Western periodization. What do I mean by periodization? That is classification or categorization of the different epochs in history, is what I mean by periodization. The Western, you can call Eurocentric, Eurocentric periodization. Why do I say Eurocentric? Because, because of arrogance. Because Europe has, has colonized the world. Because the Europe emerged as imperial power in the world, at least in recent history. Therefore, the Europe sees itself as the center of the world. It sees itself as the center of the world against which all references about world happenings or events would be hinged to European history. So this is Eurocentric periodization of history. 
as against other forms of periodization. And in that periodization, they categorize the history of the world broadly into three epochs. Ancient history, medieval history, and modern history. This is the Western periodization of history. Ancient, medieval, and modern. Ancient, you know, constitutes aspects of stories about the story of the early man. Or when you want to see it from the perspective of the Darwin's theory of evolution from the time of the chimpanzee, are you following? To the times of the early man, to agrarian times, I mean the Stone Age and others, and all this constitutes ancient history. And then medieval history and uh, modern history. This 21st century we are talking about falls within the so-called modern history. So when we are talking about the 21st century, we are talking about modernity. So when we are talking about the lessons of the Hijra to the 21st century, we are talking about the lessons of Hijra to modernity or to modern times. Because 21st century falls within, as far as Western periodization of history is concerned, it falls within modern times. It falls within modern time. For a Muslim, before I pass this point, we may have an, our own independent periodization of history, what we may call the Quranic periodization of history. The Quranic periodization of history. If you look at many surahs of the Quran, you will see that the Quran has its own periodization of history. Just have a look at Surah Al-A'raf. If you have a look at Surah Al-A'raf, you can see the Quranic periodization of history. The Quran gives us different epochs in Surah Al-A'raf. From the beginning of creation, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, he was in Al-Jannah and he was brought down. So from the beginning, from, from, from Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam constitutes an epoch. And from Nuh alayhi salam, to Hud alayhi salam constitutes an epoch. From Hud alayhi salam to Saleh alayhi salam constitutes an epoch. From Saleh alayhi salam to Ibrahim alayhi salam constitutes an epoch. From Ibrahim alayhi salam to Musa alayhi salam constitutes an epoch. From Musa alayhi salam to Isa alayhi salam constitutes another epoch. And from Isa alayhi salam to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam constitutes another epoch. This is the Quranic periodization of history as against Western periodization of history. By the way, now talking about the 21st century, let us try to make sense of the 21st century. And making sense of the 21st century begins with the fact that the 21st century falls within the Western era of modernity. And modernity in this sense, when you look at it from the perspective of periodization, modernity has a number of dimensions of meaning. Modernity has a number of dimensions of meaning. And at one dimension, is it constitutes an epoch, as we are talking. It's an epoch in history. At another dimension, modernity is a worldview. At another dimension, modernity is a historical reality. We're not talking about, we're not going to talk about modernity as a historical reality as such, but we may be more interested in discussing modernity as an epoch that began in an evolutionary way from the Renaissance, from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment project. For those who are conversant and acquainted with Western intellectual history, from the Renaissance to the intellectual uh, enlightenment project, to the scientific revolution, to technological revolution, culminating in industrial revolution, and from industrial revolution now to, I mean, to colonialism, industrial revolution leading to colonialism, colonialism ensuring the dominance of the West, the, 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 the wave of the West, the West dominating the whole world, and then from colonialism to globalization, the 21st century. There is no time.
to discuss this trajectory and all the happenings. But perhaps if we will further try to illustrate the implication of the 21st century, we will say that although being component, part and parcel of modernity, but the 21st century presents an important epoch in the, in the, in the entire modernity. How? With scientific revolution leading to technological revolution. What do, what do we mean by technological revolution? Technological revolution, which is a product of scientific revolution, is nothing but meaning the fact that, you see, in pre-scientific age, in pre-scientific age, in pre-technological age, people used to produce in units. You, they produce whatever items they want to produce or they intend to produce in units. Are you following? When a, when a blacksmith wants to produce for tenure, he can only do it just about in just single digits in a day. When a Masai, what do you call him, a weaver, intends to weave godo or whatever, it takes him about a week. Look at what our Masai hula do. They take how many days to to inka their hula. Are you, are you getting this? Now, this is, this, this, these are all aspects of pre-technological revolution. But with the scientific revolution culminating in technological revolution, technology brought about the, the creation or establishment of factories, whereby items that would, have, uh, that would take several days to produce just a single one, with technology, you produce in thousands. That is what they call technological revolution. And then with this technological revolution, factories began to be what? To be established in Europe. Because that is why it happened. When factories were established, then you have industrial revolution. Industries, are you following? Sprang up. And with industrial revolution, another thing began. That is rural urban migration. Rural urban people migrating from rural areas to come and settle in the urban areas to get jobs and employments in the industries. Then mega cities began to arise. Mega cities like, like, like London, mega cities like uh, Frankfurt, mega cities like Paris, and so on and so forth, and spilling, spilling over to places like Tokyo, Moscow, Beijing. These are all byproducts of modernity. And then the raw materials in Europe became exhausted. And the factories were about to be closed down. And the Europeans were compelled to move out of Europe to look for more raw materials. That is why they came here and colonized us to get I mean, hats and skins, to get groundnut, to get auduga, so that their industry will survive. Hence colonialism. Are you getting this? And then that with colonialism, it ensures the dominance of the West. And the Western perspective of life, Western worldview, Western culture became the dominant perspective of life, and so on and so forth. You can see that was happening only around the 18th century to the 19th century to the turn of the 20th century. But so with the 20th century, with the 20th century, you got all with the 19th century, you got technological revolution, the invention of locomotive engines, locomotive engines like trains, like engine nika and other things, and then leading to what? To colonialism, which ensures our dominance. But the 21st century is itself also ushered in by another thing. While the 20th century was ushered in, by the invention of locomotive engines leading to industrial revolution, the 21st century is ushered in by information revolution, the invention of the human of the artificial brain, the invention of the computer, which brings about information explosion, or you can say information revolution, which ensures what can be called demystification, the mystification of time and space. Before the internet comes, you would write a letter from Gombe to Bochi, 
you go and take it to the post office are you following you wait for the next two to three weeks the person gets it and gets a reply you expect a reply in about a month from here to Bauchi isn't it or from here to Lagos but with the invasion of the internet which was which ushered in the 21st century time and space came to be demystified in the sense that in the twinkling of an eye you can transfer information as big as the volume of the library of Gombe State University in just a twinkling of an eye time and space have been demystified supersonic planes have been created such that you travel within a matter of just a day to China something unimaginable in life time and space have been demystified but the Prophet ﷺ had foretold us that because he said wa yataqarabu zaman sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and if you are talking about zoom zoom the idea the concept of zoom was brought by prophet muhammad sallam because the prophet sallam said inna allah has al arda allah had zoomed the world to me from its beginning to its end sayyib lugu hadha dinu ma balagha al wa nahar up to the end of the hadith that is just by the way now coming to the sira coming to the hijra you see why i was saying some people if you meet a a, a a a a free thinker who tell you how can you be talking about 15th century or 10 i mean a, uh, how many centuries ago i mean into this world in which man has unravelled atom atom man has been able to invent nuclear nuclear uh, you know uh, atoms nuclear nuclear bombs that can annihilate a total community it happened in hiroshima nagasaki isn't it man has been able to traverse the space and land on the moon and now they're talking about landing on the mars man has been able to dive into the depths of the ocean and unravel the secrets of the depths of the ocean as deep as the pacific ocean man has dived into the, the depths of pacific ocean the deepest ocean in the world or the wildest ocean in the world atlantic ocean man has been able to demystify it man can dive into it and bring out the secrets of that you're talking about 21st century and you're talking about something in the 15th century are you following now what i said at the beginning about the fact that the prophet's message was a universal message and therefore all that we would say all that we would say today about the fact that the 21st century is knowledge driven is information driven it cannot make the message and the seerah of the prophet to be outdated it cannot make it to be what outdated i may not have to take time to waste time to to narrate the nitty-gritty details of the hijra because i've been told that my time was off a few minutes ago maybe just a quick important lessons that would need to be and especially and especially the focus is lessons for the islamic ummah lessons for the islamic ummah in the 21st century unfortunately mr chairman your royal highness in this 21st century that we have just illustrated the advancements in human progress in this 21st century the islamic world or you may as well say the muslim ummah the muslim ummah is still in disarray the muslim ummah is still disorganized i could remember at the time when we, mo we we formed the muslim teachers association that i was referring to in the beginning of the lecture when we started meeting at jankai and uh, no, not jankai at uh <coughs> danaje gandu when we started meeting with uh, fellow teachers this was the point that was echoed that we are disorganized we don't have direction we don't have purpose 
take the biggest Islamic organization. I can see our father, Mana, Mana Abdullah Bakar Lami, Bakar Lamido. Take the biggest organizations, the Islamic organizations. Mana Salah Emburan, the secretary of the Martinus in Islam. These are some of our big Islamic organizations. You will see that such Islamic organizations don't have a blueprint for what does it want to achieve in the next 50 years. The most important lessons of the Hijra is the lesson. And I, and I, and I think when Amal Abdullah El Amiro comes to comment, perhaps he may touch this aspect, these issues about planning and strategy. And the fact that in this 21st century, everything is hinged to planning and strategy. But planning and strategy, not just arbitrary planning and strategy, but planning and strategy, you know, developed and designed against SWOT analysis and SMART analysis. And you can see SWOT analysis and SMART analysis in the Hijra of the Prophet, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wa Alihi Wasallam. So the most important implication of the hijra is the fact that we must shun what we are doing in the disorganized way we have been conducting ourselves. We're just moving. We're just moving like Afamaniyam Shimu Kidban our Alawajihi. People that don't have, you know, identified goals. When you take it from our big Islamic organization to small ones, no blueprint, no roadmap, no vision, kaza, no, not at all. We have seen documents that were designed and drafted more than 60 years ago or nearly almost 100 years ago about how Fulani would be Christianized and how Hausa would be Christianized. At the beginning, we used to dismiss it. But now we are seeing realities, isn't it? We are seeing realities. Because they had planned. You see, how do we expound this particular lesson from the Hijra of the Prophet Sallallahu We would do it from the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would, would have been taken in his physical body would have been taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Mecca to Medina in just the twinkle of an eye but Allah made him to undertake the hijrah the way he did it for us to get lessons Allah had taken the Prophet physically in the, in the night of Isra and Mi'raj but look at this condition, look at the situation, the threat. The Prophet undertook the hijrah under threat of his life. And Allah would have you know, protected him from that threat by just taking him in his physical body, as it was done in Isra and Mi'raj. This was the condition in which he undertook the hijrah. But Allah made him to undertake the hijrah the way he did. How was it undertaken? The Prophet just didn't go out like that. He had to undertake a plan. One important thing, secrecy. Secrecy in your plan. The Prophet kept the secret of the, his departure with only Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. In leadership, you have to have confidence. You have to have confidence, isn't it? He made the secret just between him and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He confided in him. He asked him to get the transport, to prepare the transport. Secretly, Abu Bakr prepared the transport. That was what was done. And then, in addition to that, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 
while undertaking the hijrah didn't just go out like that in a disorganized manner the 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 the, the navigation isn't it the direction of the hij of the of the path the path had to be identified the route the route had to be identified and it wouldn't be the common route because he went out under threat it wouldn't be the common way, uh, road to Medina it has to be a different route altogether and therefore a guide had to be identified they had to get a guide who would know the route and then because the Prophet was conscious it would be stupid and it would be foolish when you are going under threat to think that you will just go out and start walking and your enemies will not come running after you running after you to, to, to get you to intercept you therefore a hiding place had to be you know identified but when you hide there was no there was no uh, cellular phone when you hide in the hiding place when there was no cellular phone and of course you know Allah can do wahi to him but just for us to get lessons isn't it there was no cellular phone but then how would you know that the people searching for you had stopped the search and it was safe for you now to come out they had to get the informant who would come into Mecca to listen to what was happening in Mecca and then he would secretly in the night come and narrate to the Prophet and his companion Filghari isn't it and then if you had to hide for several days if you had to hide for several days then how would you feed yourselves the feeding arrangement had to be made and a lady for that matter was identified was 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 tasked with that who would come in the night and bring food and then if people would have to be coming from Mecca to the to the gray I mean to the to the to the cave Arabs as desert people were very perfect in terms of following footprint it was very possible that the footprint of those that were shuttling would be identified from Mecca to the cave then an arrangement had to be made in such a way that the footprint should be obliterated should be distorted so very early in the morning a cattle rearer would come and follow the footpath and would the steps of the cattle the footprint would be obliterated these were aspects of planning and strategy and i think a very important point needs to be discussed here because you may be challenged do i mean shiites do challenge us do challenge al sunnah in this saying that look you people were saying that uh, umar announced his hijrah you people are saying that umar announced his hijrah isn't it that he he said whoever wants his wife to be a widow and his children to be orphans isn't it and his mother to lose her son umar was migrating you can confront me shiites in their books used to say that you people are now with this are now you know projecting umar to be more brave than the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the answer to this that was given by scholars especially scholars of sirah scholars of fiqh sirah like muhammad ramadan al buti and others said the answer to this is the fact that whatever umar did or any companion would do at that time especially when prophet muhammad sallallahu was alive that was only restricted to him to his own self but the prophet sallallahu is a musharri the prophet sallallahu gives laws the prophet sallallahu 
you know, gives life, gives way of life. Therefore, he had to operate within the, the parameters of normalcy, which normal people can all undertake. I hope that is clear. He had to operate within, you know, normal the normal curve. Not that the Prophet was not as brave as Prophet as Umar radiallahu anhu. Uh, this may be the lessons, just I mean, pertaining to the actual pre-hijra and the pro process of the hijra and the actual hijra itself. But other important lessons that were very important about the hijra was the arrival of the Prophet وسلم, and most importantly the construction of the mosque the construction of the mosque what does that imply what is the implication of that and then the, 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 the creation of fraternity fraternity and, uh, and brotherhood among the companions and then the establishment of a framework for a plural society pluralism especially because of the fact that Allah had said in the Quran but that was not the will of Allah isn't it people I mean the whole world cannot be Muslims and therefore it means it has been destined it has been destined that Muslims would have to live with non-Muslims in the world Societies, human communities would have to be plural communities, multicultural, multi-religious. So the framework for multiculturalism, multi-ethnicism was what? Created right at that time. There are very important lessons regarding the fact that the mosque was the first thing to be created. Now, with the arrival of the Prophet Sallam, a nascent Islamic society was emerging and a nascent Islamic state was also emerging but it has to have a fortress it has to have a, a what a fortress and the mosque was the fortress a rallying point of some sort so you we, we need to see the mosque beyond a mere place of worship where you just go and perform rituals but the mosque is the spirit of the Islamic society the mosque is the nucleus of the Islamic society. The mosque is the fortress of the Islamic society. That is why we must take our mosque very seriously. And that is why, that is why we must not abandon our mosque. Our mosque should be our rallying point where all important decisions will be taken. But that is when we make our mosque lively. And that is when we make our mosque, you know, vibrant. And that is when we must make our mosque impactful on the society. A situation whereby the mosque is just meant to be a sort of ghost place of some sort. Where you only go and worship ritual and you come out. People don't see the significance of the mosque to their, to, to their lives. Why can't we discuss in our mosque? how we would take care of the orphans around the neighborhood of the mosque. Why wouldn't we discuss in our mosque how to take care of the almajri within the neighborhood of our mosque? Why our mosques are not functional? Why? Modernity, I mean, brotherhood. This has important implication, especially in the 21st century, where ICT gadgets have virtually or essentially divided people what that implies is that human community would always remain human when physical association fraternal association exists so ICTs cannot replace that ICTs if they keep separating us they would be dehumanizing us. They would be dehumanizing us. And so on and so forth. Let me stop at this point.
Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh At-takbir please That has been Speech by our guest speaker of the day Professor Salih Sushehu On the lessons from Hijrah To 21st century Islamic perspective If you remember very well It has been observed that This lecture should be summarized In Hausa so that uh, the lesson and the message will reach those that does not understand English very well but due to time factor, this cannot be done only that I will emphasize maybe one or two points that Prof has said I am not in a position to discuss Prof's paper but I will just say one or two words out of what he said Kamariyada Akasemi Prof Yai Maganani Akan lessons were to There is a the Kamata Akuya the Gehijara Madala Salah Salama Zua twenty first century Zua Kanina I shouldn't that they are Yai Maganan Hijira Faratari Hijira Aku Mam and Kurdi Biate Hijira Aku Hijira the Lefi Zua in the Ba Lefi the Kumamutu Aura Chiwa Ekata Lefi the Kanshi the De Soransu Thank you, sir. So, we have discussed, so we'll discuss this paper from three different perspectives. We'll start with Malam Nasr Ishaq, who is the Deputy Provost of College of Nursing and Midwifery, Gundi, who will discuss this topic from the security perspective. Malam Ishaq, I'm inviting you to the podium, please.